weeks out of phase, they completely cancel. We click up that, Matt. <laughs> I totally forgot. Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay, so waves can either add, when they add together, they can either produce uh, uh, an intensified wave or they can completely cancel out from each other. Now, where this comes into effect is when you have something like multiple sources of uh, waves. So this uh, illustrates uh, the old Young's slit experiment where you have waves coming in from the left uh, they're going then through two slits, S1 and S2, and be, they, are, they are initially in phase going through those two orifices. And then at certain angles, these waves will add together and pr produce an intensified wave, and at other angles, they will cancel each other out. You get to subtract them. And you will see that, as you see on the right, you will see that there are areas that are high intensity and areas of low intensity. So this interference phenomenon is what is key to doing diffraction. Now, perhaps you have seen an illustration like this before. Uh, of This is often used for x-rays, where you have waves that are in phase coming into a solid sample. As the waves strike and interact with an atom, they get scattered. And coming out, they will may or may not be in phase, depending on which atoms they are striking. So in order to have them not only in phase as they come in, but in phase as they go out, you need to have an integral number of path lengths uh, so that they add constructively. Well, if we try to uh, give this more schematic, we can think of the atoms being in planes, so we have the wave coming in from the, uh, from the left, and these wave fronts are in phase. But now the wave that strikes the lower atom has to travel farther than the wave that hits the upper atom. So if the path length is not an integer number of wavelengths, you don't get constructive interference. So to determine when this path length is an integer number of wavelengths, we use the Bragg equation, which is up on the right. So if the number of wavelengths is equal to 2d sine theta, then you get constructive interference. And you can just go back to your basic uh, trigonometry and geometry and figure out these angles and the difference in path length. So that is the condition that we consider for constructive interference and where we will see uh, a strong diffraction peak coming out from our sample. So this tells us then, since we know the wavelength and we can measure the angle, this then tells us the spacing between the atomic planes. Now, if we take this um, illustration, let's rotate it a bit. And we put this into a TEM sample. Right, so a TEM sample has to be thin enough that you can get an electron beam through it. So generally on the order of 100, maybe 200 nanometers. So now uh, we have our beam coming in directly uh, from the top and going out at the bottom. And now we have this kind of a geometry where we have a direct beam coming through and our Bragg diffracted electrons are coming out at an angle. And the angle between the incident beam and the scattered beam is always going to be two theta, so twice the Bragg angle. Bragg angle being defined as the angle between the plane and the incident uh, radiation. So based on this now, if we start thinking about wavelengths, people do a lot of diffraction work with x-rays and the most common uh, X-ray that is used is the copper K alpha X-ray, which is has a wavelength of one and a half, roughly one and a half angstroms, 0.15 nanometers, which is roughly what the spacing between atoms are. Now we start looking at what we're doing with electrons. 
our wavelengths are much, much shorter, as you see. And the wavelength also depends on the accelerating voltage of the that these electrons go through. So the energy of the electron is uh, uh, inversely proportional to its wavelength. So as you can see, our electron wavelengths are about 50 to 60 times smaller than the X-ray wavelengths. Well, what that means, if you think about Bragg's, the Bragg equation, is that our angles are going to be 50 or 60 times smaller than what you would see in X-ray diffraction. So in X-ray diffraction, you may see scattering angles 50, 60 degrees. In electron diffraction, you may be down order of a degree, one degree, two, you know, or somewhere thereabouts, very small angles. Well, if we take the uh, scattering and the diffraction effects, and we record that on either a camera or a sheet of film, we would see something that looks like this where if we have a large number of crystals in the electron beam, we will see a polycrystalline pattern, which is this ring pattern on the left. Or if we happen to have a single crystal in the beam and we get the crystal oriented, so we're looking down one of its uh, primary symmetry axes, we can see a nice clean uh, spot pattern on the right. Now, it's all well and good to be thinking about Bragg's law, but as we're trying to work with the diffraction patterns, it's sometimes more convenient to actually think about diffraction in terms of wave vectors. And this is called, this is thinking in reciprocal space. So the wave vector can be thought of as a vector that is normal to the wave front and the length of the vector is inversely proportional to the wavelength, one over lambda. So then we can describe our incoming wave with a vector k0, and the outgoing wave, and we'll assume that's in the diffracting condition, as vector k. Well, if you have now a vector that's changed like that, how do you get from k0 to k? Well, you have to add the vector capital K to get make the difference between these two. So K0 plus capital K is equal to the uh, outgoing wave vector K, small k. So that is how you would describe the scattering going on. So the crystal is adding the vector capital K. Now, since we're talking about elastic scattering where there's no loss of energy, that means the wavelength of the incoming wave and the outgoing wave are going to be the same. So if we think about that, that means that all of our vectors will be the same length, which means that they define the surface of a sphere, which the uh, German physicist P.P. Ewald uh, defined back in the 1920s. It's a very useful construction for us to help visualize diffraction. Now, if we have to define our waves in terms of K, we also need to take our lattice, crystal lattice, and also express that in a similar way. And that's known as the reciprocal lattice. And you can easily derive the fact that when the Avol sphere intersects a reciprocal lattice point, you will have constructive interference and you meet the Bragg condition. So these are equivalent ways of saying the same thing. Now we saw that uh, the wavelength of electrons that we're working with in the TEM is much, much smaller than that of uh, X-rays. So whereas the Avald sphere for X-rays is roughly the same size as atomic spacing, the reciprocal lattice spacings, for electrons, our Avald sphere is much, much larger than the spacing that you would have in a reciprocal lattice. It's almost flat. So if we look where the Avald sphere intersects 
the reciprocal lattice, you can see that it intersects quite a number of spots here near the, or, near the origin. So that is our going to be our um, criterion for seeing when we have diffraction taking place in the TPM. And once again, if you take a crystal and you orient it, you will get, in this case, this is uh, a 1011 type pattern. This is a single crystal and the avald sphere is intersecting the reciprocal lattice at each one of these diffraction spots. Now, if we actually have a sample that has lots and lots of crystals, we can describe that as a powder pattern or a polycrystalline pattern. So if you have a large number of crystals near infinite, with random orientations, you will get a ring pattern like this, because no matter where in your beam, you're going to have some crystal that is in a diffracting condition. And even amorphous materials will give what looks like a diffraction pattern due to the scattering, because you have a certain interatomic spacing that is uh, preferred. And you will see that in the diffraction pattern. So now, looking at a polycrystalline pattern or a powder pattern, what information can we get from a pattern like this? Well, the first thing you can do is you can start to measure the radius. And if you have a nice calibrated pattern like this, you know you can now measure what your scattering angles are. You can, from this, and you can uh, also pull out the D spaces, right? Because this is going to go by Bragg's law. So that's one bit of information you can do. You will also notice that the rings vary in intensity. So you can pull out some of the intensity information. And you can uh, also look at the spacings between the rings. So some, you notice that there are two rings near at small radius, there's a gap, and then two more rings. So by looking at these ratios, even if we don't have an exact calibration, we can infer something about the crystal structure. Because each crystal will have certain allowed and forbidden reflections or spacings, um, depending on the arrangement of the atoms that you have. So you can pull that kind of information out from something like this. You can also do what's called single crystal diffraction. And again, we are looking down one particular symmetry direction of a crystal. This being a cubic crystal and we're looking right down one of the face uh, against one of the faces. And you see that there's a nice cubic symmetry so once again, we can use this, we can measure the, uh, the radii of these spots, the spacings of these spots, but now we can also measure the angles between them because each set of spots corresponds to a set of lattice planes. So we can start to see the angles between the lattice planes in our crystal. So that's all very well and good. That works very nicely for a lot of stuff. But let's take a look at this Avald sphere again. I said it is almost flat, but not complete. There is curvature to it. And if you look, you can see that it curves out as we move farther and farther away from the origin. So if I kind of give a, a schematic of this, very exaggerated curvature. What you have is a reciprocal lattice with, that reflects the real space atomic arrangement. But as the Avald sphere curves, it will intersect reciprocal lattice points at a different level. And remember, when the Avald sphere intersects a reciprocal lattice point, we will see diffraction taking place. We meet the Bragg condition. So here's an example with of a, uh, and it may be a little bit hard for you to see. The contrast isn't that great. 
But here is a spot pattern. And if you look between the rings here, you can see there's another set of spots occurring. And that's where the avon sphere intersects that next level in reciprocal mass. This is kind of handy if you're trying to measure spacings, because now you can measure spacings also parallel to the beam rather than in the xy plane. You can measure things in the z plane. But it's a little hard to do it. What's the radius of this? It's a little hard to tell. Normally, when we're doing diffraction, we're always trying to get the most parallel beam possible. But if we relax that condition and converge our beam down to through a large angle, like you would have here, the beam coming in, now you actually wind up with a range of aval spheres, one for each angle that the beam is coming in. And you will see that they intersect uh, these, upper, these upper levels, these what they're called higher order Lowy zones, um, much more effectively. So if you do that, here's an example of a um, convergent beam electron diffraction pattern uh, known as CBED. So if you look carefully in the center, you can see that because we've converged the beam now, we don't have nice sharp spots, but we see the standard diffraction pattern. And now we start to see a ring around the outside showing us where that avol sphere, those avol spheres are intersecting the upper level in the reciprocal lattice. Now, this can be very handy because if I'm taking a spot pattern and I look at this pattern, in the inside the circle, I see what looks like a hexagonal symmetry. I would expect this crystal to be hexagonal, but it isn't. If we start to look now at this outer ring, I can see that I've actually got some mirror planes. So from 12 to 6, there's a nice mirror plane. You can fold the pattern over and see that it matches up. And you can do it uh, from four to 10 and from eight to two, and they all match up um, as far as mirror planes go. But now, if it's hexagonal, we should see, be able to rotate the pattern by 60 degrees and it should match up as well. And if you look at it here in this outer ring, You've got two small arcs. If I rotate it 60 degrees from two, from two o'clock up to about 12 o'clock, you see that at 12 o'clock, there's only a single line in that ring. So the hexagonal symmetry doesn't, rotational symmetry doesn't exist. You don't have a six-fold rotational symmetry. So this actually, while it looks in the, what we call the zero order Lowy zone here in the center. Well, it looks like it's a hexagonal symmetry. It is actually only a threefold symmetry. So you can actually pull out information about the crystal structure from these outer rings that help illuminate what's going on in the center. Now you also notice that we have these lines running radially through the pattern. These are known as Kikuchi lines, and they can actually be uh, very handy because they are actually showing us where the planes of the crystal are. So I can actually tilt my crystal and follow these Kikuchi lines to another what we call crystal zone. So I can see the symmetry of the crystal from another direction and be able to calculate what that direction is. So people have actually done maps of these Kikuchi lines, these Kikuchi maps. So we were here, uh, I guess this was a threefold down here, uh, but you can follow these lines from one crystallographic zone to another and know exactly what you're looking at. So people have done the maps here and you can see these, these markings. If you've done SEM, the EBSD pattern that you see in SEM is exactly the same as this. And the technique now known as EBSD 
for a while also had the name EBKD, electron beam Kikuchi diffraction, as people from TEM tried to impose their names on the SEM people who had none of it. Now, the idea of convergent beam electron diffraction has a number of applications. Now, here's another one that can be done with uh, convergent beam. So if you set up so that you have only one set of lattice planes that is very strongly diffracted, and you come in with a convergent beam and look very closely at the diffraction spots. Now, this is the direct beam that you're seeing very, very bright. But if you look very carefully at the diffracted beam, there are parallel lines running through. These are due to what's called dynamical diffraction. So where the diffracted beam has an appreciable intensity relative to the direct beam, it starts to diffract as well. And you get these interference lines showing up. And these are proportional to the thickness of your crystal. So you can actually use that to measure the thickness of the sample that you're looking at. So that's just another uh, application of, what, of diffraction in the TEM. Now, I've been showing examples thus far that have all been from the physical sciences, metallurgy, semiconductors, and so on. But diffraction has a long history in uh, the biological sciences as well. Back in the 1950s, Rosalind Franklin took this famous X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA that Watson and Crick used to claim all the credit. Um, but she determined the structure based on this type of a pattern. They found that it was this chiral spiral structure. Well, X-ray diffraction has been used frequently through the years. Uh, most more recently, it has been used for elucidating protein structures. The problem comes in that for X-ray diffraction, you need large crystals. And researchers have spent years trying to come up with a large crystal of various proteins. So uh, the trick is not so much the acquisition of the data as growing the crystal, because you need something like millimeters in size. Well, here we have uh, been starting to work on a new technique known as micro electron diffraction, which is a precession diffraction technique. So we can actually work with crystals that are micron size and smaller and actually pull out the same kind of information that uh, you do with X-ray diffraction on some of these larger crystal sizes. So this is a movie that was made by uh, Nicole, Nicole Biffo here at uh, CMAS of a potential drug candidate. So what she did was uh, put the sample into the microscope and then recorded a movie as she tilted the sample. So got exposures at all different angles of the crystal. And then came up with something that looks like this. So she records this movie and then takes all those individual diffraction patterns, puts them into uh, a program and comes up with these diffraction spots in her pattern. Now, because it was tilting around a certain angle, you have a certain loss of information at one particular angle in the diffraction pattern. So what you do is you take another crystal at random, which would be randomly oriented, and you do the same thing. You come up with another pattern like this, but with a different axis where you've lost information. And then you can take and use the same uh, software that the X-ray crystallography people use to elucidate a structure. So another technique that's being done here at CMAS that also involves diffraction is stem diffraction. And uh, this is sometimes referred to as 4D uh, stem. So normally, when we're doing STEM imaging, scanning transmission electron microscopy, we're taking a fine probe and sweeping it across the sample, just like you do in an SEM. But we have then an integrating detector underneath. 
So at each point, we're just recording an intensity. But now that intensity, because these are all scattered electrons that we're looking at, we're seeing diffraction effects. But we're integrating that out when we use a single detector. So if we were to put a camera down below, we can actually collect a diffraction pattern at each pixel in a stem image. Now, the camera we have here is designed for very high dynamic range, maybe not as many pixels as this. But even so, uh, if you think about it, you've got a 2D image on your sample and then another two dimensions for your diffraction pattern. So your data set size goes up very quickly. So with the system we have here, our normal images are 17 gigabytes each. So you can fill up a hard drive quickly. There are other facilities that are using uh, large cameras. So you're getting one, for example, a, uh, a 1K by 1K camera to record each diffraction pattern. So that's one megapixel at each pixel in my stem image. So that's, if you collect a 1K by 1K image, you're collecting 10 to the 12th pixels per image, which uh, makes data handling interesting. So what can you use something like this for? Well, one of the things that people are using it for is called geometric phase analysis. So in the semiconductor industry, they are growing layers upon substrates. And here is a uh, strontium titanium oxide, titanium strontium oxide sample, STO set, uh, substrate with a film being grown on it. Now the upper image has no defects in it, but this lower image uh, has a defect right at the interface. So what's going to be the difference between these? Well, if we actually map out the displacement of each atom from the relaxed position, uh, you can see the scale on the right. So you see that in the x-axis, there's a lot of uh, strain or a lot of shifting of these atoms away from their normal position. The blue curves are showing the amount of strain and the map, the color map, is showing also the amount of strain that you have at different positions. So what effect does the defect have? Well, you can see that all the strain is now isolated around one spot. You relax the strain in the other two directions. So these defects relax the strain, but uh, generally the defects also cause electrical problems in semiconductors. So they try to avoid those. Another example of 4D STEM is in a slightly different area. So as you're, if you have electrons traveling through a magnetic material, the magnet, magnetic field in the material will also deflect the electrons. And you can map that out with a, with a STEM detector, a 4D STEM. So if you have a number of crystals in your sample and the right-hand image is showing the crystals that you have, the left-hand image is actually showing the magnetic field lines through this sample. So uh, I hope that what I've been able to show thus far is just giving an example of the richness of the kind of information you can get from diffraction experiments in the TEM. So with that, I will show you some of the resources that we have at CMAS available for you. And we're more than happy to talk about this kind of thing, usually at quite some length. And uh, then I will open it up for any questions and just uh, let you know how you can keep up with us and connect with us. So are there any questions, Dan? I um, have one question online. Um, so if anyone else has questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, we have people in here that can ask questions as well. Um, yeah, to get things started off with, there's one. That was how um, can the poly, how can you differentiate between the polycrystalline diffraction patterns and the amorphous scattering patterns? Okay, if you look at the sharpness of the rings, because a crystalline sample will have very well defined uh, spacings be between one atom and another. 
So the polycrystalline sample will have very sharp rings. The amorphous material, because the interatomic spacing is, is uh, not as well defined, will have very fuzzy rings. Any other questions that people have? That was the first question we had. Yeah. There's other questions. Uh, we're around for a while in case people have questions. So feel free to hang around, ask those. If you have more in depth questions, want to talk to Hank, I can also unmute you. You can ask questions as well. Okay. Here's a question. Um, how do we calculate despacing from diffraction spots? Okay, so the diffraction spots, you, at some point you, you want to calibrate your microscope. So you normally will put in a crystal that has known despacings. And then you will collect a diffraction pattern from that crystal. And that will give you the calibration between the despacings or the ring diameter and the pixels you have on your camera. So you get your pixels per reciprocal nanometer or pixels per recipro reciprocal angstrom. So you can use that to measure it. Okay, and next question. What is normally the database you use for lattice parameters and space groups? For lattice parameters, the most common database is the ICDD database, which is used for X-ray diffraction. So you're doing similar kinds of experiments to X-ray diffraction. Um, so you can use that to get your D spacings and your injured planar spacings. Uh, there is also the ICSD, the Inorganic Crystal Structure Database, which actually has the crystal structure in it. And you can use that to actually calculate patterns and use that to measure your D spacings and actually calculate single crystal diffraction patterns from that, match that up against your unknown. When you load in a sample of known D space and you calibrate, is that something you have to do at the start of every experiment or do you just do it once and it's good forever? Okay. Do you have to calibrate for every experiment? Generally not. Um, normally I do this several times a year just to ensure that nothing has changed in the microscope. Um, it will hold pretty well, you know, across time. However, it does require that your lenses always be at the same strength. When you're working in an electron microscope, we're working with magnetic lenses. And by changing the current in the lens, you're changing its focal length and hence its magnification. So you have to be extremely careful to keep your sample at what we call the eccentric height and keep the objective lens focused on that and keep your diffraction lens focused at the right place as well. If you do that, then, then you're good to easily better than 1% and you can do better than a half a percent reproducibility. Uh, so my question was kind of, so you're talking about biological samples and that's probably the biggest problem is beam damage on them compared to x-rays. So if you want to right. talk about that and like how that can be solved a little bit and how right. long you actually run those experiments for on those <laughs> crystals. Yes. Electrons interact much more strongly with matter than do, uh, than, than do x-rays. So yes, you will get significantly more beam damage from electrons than you do from x-rays. So what we do need to do is to one, keep our dose as small as possible. And two, we can cool our samples and work in cryo temperatures to minimize the movement of atoms within the material. So the field of cryo-electron microscopy has grown tremendously. The movie that uh, Nicole took was done under cryo-electron conditions with an extremely sensitive camera so that we don't need many electrons to collect this kind of pattern. So generally for the micro ED type patterns, you want less than 25 or 30 electrons per square angstrom 
dose, total dose through the pattern. And then you move on to another area on the set. A couple more questions have come in and I'll ask these ones first and we'll get to someone that's raising their hand in a second. Um, so one is, how do you align the zone axis to get the best diffraction spot? How do we know we're in the zone axis? Okay. Spots? Well, that's where we use the Kikuchi lines to follow uh, from one zone to another. So if you have a crystalline sample and you put it in the microscope, you can generally see these Kikuchi lines. So you will find a narrow pair of Kikuchi lines that are fairly large, which means you have fairly large despacing on those planes. Large despacings will lead to higher symmetry zones. So you can follow a set of Kikuchi lines to find a higher symmetry zone. And then you can use that then to uh, go to other zones that are within the tilt range of the microscope. There is a limitation there because you can't go 360 degree tilt in the TPM. And then how is the dynamic change in crystal phase slash atom displacement due to electron beam heating? How's that handled in data analysis of the diffraction spots? Very carefully. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of work that goes in into this kind of thing. So to get a, a fully reproducible experiment, you do have to work very carefully. But they will normally take this with respect to an undisturbed part of the lattice. So they would go somewhere off to the side and record the, uh, the pattern there and then use that to compare the uh, affected area. Okay, so um, Shantanu, if I said that right, I'm going to let you talk if you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. So my question is regarding uh, the real analysis, actually. So um, if I have to use a, a technique called diffractive imaging, which is similar to the tychography in STEM, so how fast I can record the diffractive imaging data sets? Like if I'm performing in situ uh, measurements in an uncorrected instruments. And so because diffractive imaging gives me better resolution as compared to bright field or phase contrast imaging because diffraction pattern uh, suffers less from aberrations. So I just wanted to know how fast I can go with diffractive imaging technique. Uh the speed really depends on your hardware. Uh, you do need to have enough current in the beam to collect a decent diffraction pattern, but it's more the readout of the chip. Uh, so on one of my systems, I can do one, one pixel every 12 seconds, which is pretty slow. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of these other ones, you can do several hundred frames per second. So it depends on how much you're trying to read out and uh, and work with, but uh, yeah, it, it it's usually you know seconds to a minute or two to collect a a four D stem image, depending on the number of pixels you have. Okay, so the applicability is limited for in situ measurements. <laughs> uh, depends on how fast your in situ stuff is going. There are some systems, uh, I believe, out at the National Center that can go hundreds of frames per second, but that's, they have a, a direct pipeline over to the supercomputer center to swallow mm -hmm. this, uh, this torrent of data that's coming through. You know, you're getting, you know, terabytes per minute of, uh, of data coming through the, uh, the system. So it's a data handling problem as much as anything else. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question that came in. How can we account for the dynamical diffraction if we want to study the microstructure using SAD? Generally, in SAD, you're not looking too much at your spot intensities. You're looking more at the spot positions and angles. Um, you're almost always, with electrons, you're almost always in a, in a dynamical situation. So you don't worry too much about at least I haven't worried too much about dynamical diffraction until I go into a convergent beam mode. Okay. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll hang out for another minute or two if people have questions, but um, I'd like to thank Hank for giving the talk again. I appreciate this and his insight into this and um, how I appreciate how he teaches as well. Thanks again, Hank. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, matter is dead. If you have questions, um, you can send us an email. Email Hank, and we can get back to you on that. Uh, see you guys all next month. Fortunately, I think the uh, room mic picked it up.